Recently, a couple of cases in particular have brought the whole thing into the light, and it turns out there are some rules to follow. Three people lose their jobs, another five are suspended following devastating findings over the case of Baby P. Six months before the death of Baby P, a social worker in Haringey told her employers that they were failing to protect children. When nothing was done, she took matters into her own hands. Do you remember thinking you were a whistleblower? I don't really like that term because a whistleblower, it means that you're, you're letting someone, something out of the bag that shouldn't be let out of the bag. What I did was inform the authorities, well it started with my own managers in Haringey, that something was wrong, children weren't being protected. And then from there it became a whistleblower because I went outside of the ranks. Each boss announces losses of over £10 billion pounds for last year. Paul Moore was a senior manager at HBOS. He told the bank it was taking too many risks. For speaking out, Paul was forced out of his job with a settlement in 2005. There was a sales culture that was out of balance with the organization's ability to control it. Uh, and how did you go about blowing the whistle? Telling people clearly and rigorously, on the basis of evidence, what had gone wrong. What drove you to the point of whistleblowing? The importance of the truth. And did you also feel a sense of loyalty to the institution or to the many people in it who were trying to do right by the bank? I had a, a deep sense of loyalty to the organisation and I did everything because I cared about all the constituents, the customers, the shareholders and the employees. Tonight a civil servant, Derek Pasquale, walked free after his trial collapsed. He was charged with offences under the Secrets Act for leaking Foreign Office material to the New Statesman magazine and to the Observer. Derek, you're different from our other two cases. How? I knew about internal procedures which were available for me to raise my concerns, but I thought that this was too important to be tied up within the office and risk never seeing the light of day, and I took the decision to actually go straight to a journalist and discuss those concerns with him. And what drove you to the point of whistleblowing? I felt that there was a, a requirement for wider debate about the issues concerned. I had to take some action. Did the system fight you back? They attempted to crush me, attempted to discredit me, um, all sorts of things. I mean, this is four years of my life. Well, I got fired. Uh, I became toxic waste. Yeah, a persona non grata, a person who other people, because I was a troublemaker. So it drove me out of my professional career. I was arrested in um, January 2006. Uh, as a result of that arrest, I was suspended from my place of work. Uh, one could say that the consequences were significant. Tony Wright helped introduce the first law to protect whistleblowers back in 1998. I think people know more about whistleblowing now, and I think it does give people more confidence to blow the whistle. But, I mean, I do, you've got to be very careful, though, because it, it, you can only blow the whistle when there is a public interest in you doing it. And that's not you deciding, you know, just for yourself, whether there, pe people might be interested in it, but whether there's really some public policy issue which requires you to do so. So it, it gives you that employment protection if you raise issues of that kind in the proper way. All three of our whistleblowers have in some way been protected by the law, either by winning their court case or receiving an out-of-court settlement. What advice would you have for others in a similar situation? I think people in a similar situation would have to, have to be very clear about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and what level of support they expect to receive. You give them my telephone number and I'll speak to them and I'll act as their advisor. You feel that's needed? I do. I'm not an expert on whistleblowing. I'm an expert to tell you the, the damage it has caused me, my family, especially my daughter. That I'm an expert on. Regarding motivation, I can tell you what motivated me to do the right thing. This is what I know of because I've lived it, I've breathed it for four years. So part of the question is really, would they do the same again? Would they whistleblow, as we're now calling it? Yes. Um, both Paul Moore and Derek Pascal said in a heartbeat, yes. Nevis Kamal said she would do it again, but she'd try and do it in a more protected, slightly more anonymous way. But the answer is yes. 
So, Annie, it ought to be simple, hasn't it? You see some wrongdoing and you go and tell the relevant authority about it and it's, it's diligently investigated and everything's sorted and you get a medal for it, but mm. in practice it's different. I know, it's a very, very complex situation, isn't it? And I think there needs to be a lot of protection around if, if, and, and a kind of procedure that is very clear that if people see that there's something unethical going on in a company that they're working for, there needs to be a safe house or a safe haven or a way procedure that they can address and they can go through that, therefore they get protection. And I think being called a snitch is a, is a really dangerous place to be. So I think we all need to be protected from yeah. that. Mm. Also, you can't... People do abuse it, don't they? You yes. get people making accusations willy-nilly for their own in less than yeah, noble uh, purposes. Yes, and listen to what Annie's saying. Both sides really need to be protected because some people have a beef against their boss mm. or are troublemakers... And dress it up. ...as, as a whistleblowing case. So you do need strict rules, and there are strict rules. And the advice that really that all of them have given is make sure you know what you're doing. And the, the real test is what's in your heart. Are you motivated by conscience, yes. or are you out there trying to whip up a stooshy, as you'd say in, uh, in Scotland? Ooh, I never heard that. Yeah. <laughs> whip you up a stooshy. You learnt something and you've Ooh, learnt a bit gosh. of Spanish today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we've got this, there's a group of lawyers called Public Concern at Work. What advice do they do they say? Well, um, just to keep it brief, we've put this, a link to them from the One Show website. And as you heard, and Paul Moore said, ring me. He feels there's a need for people to count to 25 before you do anything. You have to know you're acting basically to stop illegality and in the public good and then you need to take legal advice. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, Paddy, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, sir, some people go to extraordinary lengths to see the, uh, the truth brought to light. Many of us are more than happy to tell a few why.